order. So in Parshat uh, Chaye Sarah, we've learned but a couple of psukim, really two psukim. We focused a lot on this place uh, we call Lamarat Hamach Pela, in the city of Hebron, in the region of, or the neighborhood of Kiryat Arba. Uh, let's, uh, let me just say a couple more things about it, but I do want to move a little farther today. At the end of the Pasuk, where it describes by Avo Avraham, we're in Pasuk, I'm in Pasuk Bet, chapter 23, verse 2. So we talked about the place, it's in Eretz Canaan. Uh, we said, Vayavo Avraham, the simple understanding of Vayavo Avraham means he came to the task. Rashi understands he came from Beersheba. Others explain he was coming from Beersheba on the way back from the, uh, the Akeda, etc. All of that discussion that we've had. And then we learn, to eulogize Sarah and to cry over her. And the question could fairly be asked, why is it in that order? Wouldn't the crying happen first? And then the Hesped, uh, the, the eulogy, bringing words to grief, come later. So there are various uh, understandings that the, the um, Mefarsha Mikra give us. Among them, uh, very beautifully, Rabbi Soloveitchik writes it along these lines. He's preceded by the Kliyakar and others that, um, well, not just Kliyakar, actually a, a number of others. Kliyakar is something a little bit, la- a little bit different. The idea that the, the speaking of the words itself engendered uh, uh, more crying. And um, there's an idea here that perhaps um, there was a time lag between when she passed away and when he came of several days, perhaps. Uh, and if that's true, that per- then maybe based on the idea that Chazal teach us that the first three days of grief are called the Yemei Habachi, and then you have the other days of what we traditionally call Shiva and then Shloshim and the like. But the reality that those three days had elapsed, so he had cried already, the initial crying, he came, then he delivered the eulogy, and that engendered three more days of, of crying as a result of, uh, of that. Again, various uh, Rishonim go in, in, in different directions to try to give us uh, a window into it. The Kliyakar says very beautifully, now the Kliyakar, that um, even though normally the process of grieving is one that as time passes, there is a diminution in its intensity. When we speak about Sara Imenu, she was on such a high spiritual level. She's such a righteous person. Every passing day means her absence is felt all the more. And therefore, after the eulogy, there was even greater crying as they had a greater appreciation for who she was. Uh, Rabbi Soloveitchik writes something many centuries later. It's uh, similar along these lines. I'll quote Rabbi Soloveitchik in a minute. But uh, we're, not, we're not up to that yet. So that's, um, that's uh, some of the ideas on, on that pasuk. Let's move to the section about the, the purchase of Marana Machpelah itself. And um, yeah, thank you, Tzipor, for pointing that out. Yeah, Lispod can be all the, the layers of, uh, uh, and stages of grief. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's part of it. But you normally you would think like the Bechi is uncontrolled and the Hespit is already certain kinds of, um, of, of uh, protocols and practices or rituals or something, uh, stages. But uh, that came before the Bechi. But the two of them are, uh, are, uh, are together. If you look at the story, by the way, of Yaakov, you know, by contrast, later on in Parshat Vayichi, there the Bechi comes first, and then the, um, then the, um, the, the Hesped afterward. And that's actually what the Gemara and Moed Katan teaches, that uh, it's three days for Bechi and then seven days for Hesped. Okay. So again, different... Uh, Different, uh, different things. Okay. Pasu Gimel. Vayakom, vayakom Avraham me'al pnei meito vayidaber al b'nei chet le'mor. So Avraham got up from being in the presence of, or in, in front of, his, uh, the one who had passed away. Uh, notice, it's very subtle. Very subtle. The name Sari Imenu doesn't appear here. Do you notice? And when you get to the next pasuk, uh, it, it's going to also say, Yer v'toshav anuchi imachem, he begins to speak to them. Tenuli achuz akev imachem v'ekvara et v'ekvara meitim ilofanai. He doesn't refer to her by name. So, it's just interesting that the syntax is, um, 
is, is shifted. Uh, there might be an idea here that having passed away, now it is the one who has died, but not mentioning the name in a certain way is a, a manner of realizing that there's a letting go happening. And he's not truly burying Sarah, of course. I mean, he's burying Sarah Imenu's body. He's not burying her neshama, et cetera, right? Now, of course, we colloquially, that is how we speak. We say, uh, so-and-so passed away and they're going to be buried. But just the subtlety of language that he shifted and he said, I want to bury my dead. What did he say? I want to bury Sarah. Yeah. Uh, Shoshi, go ahead, please. Just unmute. I don't hear you. So unmute yourself. Sorry. So she hasn't been buried. So he's sitting Shiva that whole time and, and she hasn't been buried or he has not started sitting Shiva. Not started sitting Shiva. I wait for you. Right. But I, I will say the, um, the, the notion of Shiva, of course, uh, the Gemara does say, Avram Avinu knew the whole Torah and he knew all the Menhagim and everything, but the Torah does not tell us explicitly that there was a seven-day mourning period here. It does tell us this explicitly later on in the Torah about other people, and there are hints to people earlier, Mutu Shalach, very famously. But uh, we don't find that that's true in the, um, in the aggregate for, um, for, 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 uh, for the, the, uh, the Avod and the Imahot, or anybody before Matan Torah, even after Matan Torah, it doesn't actually say for everyone that they sat Shiva. For some people, it mentions. It can be assumed on one level, but on another level, we do see he came and he was giving eulogies, he was crying over her, and then he got up, and then he's asking that she be buried. Um, by the way, that is our, our order today, isn't it? I mean, first they have spayed him and then, and then the kvura. But it's immediate. Yeah. I mean, as immediate as it can be. If yeah. somebody's, you know, but yeah. it's immediate. Yeah, so it's not clear how, how, how long it was. It's just not, it's just not clear. It, it sounds like it's immediate. He came, he, was a, he, he came to, to Hebron or he came to the task, whatever it is. He eulogized her, he cried over her and he got up. Let's say he cried for three days. The three days of crying means it ensued. He gave the eulogy. He started the crying, and during the and I believe Kotan to cry over her. That was the point to cry over her. And as he's crying over her, he also has to make arrangements that she should be buried. So she's being buried. So he's still. It's in the process of the crying. Is the is the is the, uh, is the idea? Yeah. Um, he speaks and he 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 mentions. To the, he talks to the Bnei Chet. Now, why is he talking to the Bnei Chet? So if you look back, it's in Perek uh, Yud. Um, back in chapter 10, uh, verse 15. Right? Cham, the son of Noah, has four sons. And one of those sons, the fourth of the four sons, is Kinaan. And in verse 15, Uknaan Yalad et Sidon Bechorov et Chait. Vedi Vusi, Vade Mori, Vade Girgashi, Vade Chivi, Vade Arki, Vade Sini, Vade Arvadi, Vade Tzmari, Vade Chamit. Right? You get the whole list. You get the gist of it. The Bene Chait are the children of Chait. So that, that's their descendant of Canaan. They're Canaanites. The Chitim are from the family of Canaan. They're a Canaanite nation. They're part of the, the, uh, the, the, the genealogy of, of, that, uh, of that line. So he speaks to the Bnei Chet. Avram speaks to the Bnei Chet. And he spoke to them first. We know where he's going. He's going to ask for Ephraim ben Sochar. Uh, but first, he's busy talking to the Bnei Chet. Why? Why did he talk to them, generally speaking? Right? There are Mefarshim who maintain that the point here was the Bnei Chet are the townspeople who are running things. And the Chizkuni wants to argue that maybe Ephron ben Sochar is himself not from among the Bnei Chet. You'll see soon when it introduces his name, the name of Ephron, it doesn't say he's a Hittite, although it stands to reason he would be. The Chizkuni says, well, maybe he really wasn't. And this was the place of the Chitim, and therefore he needed to negotiate with them first. Alternatively, Ephron is a known entity to him, and he's known to be slippery when it comes to making deals and um, 
and, and doing business. So he wants there to be a big public display. So people will, will be on notice uh, and Efron will be on notice that this is actually uh, uh, happening. So just on the level up shot, we'll read a few psukim and then we'll, we'll dial back to analyze it a little bit more. Okay, so he speaks to the Bnei Chet and we learn, I'm a stranger and a resident. Those words themselves on the face of it sound inherently contradictory. You're a stranger and you're a resident. You're both at the same time. So what does that mean? Further, um, give me a burial plot. It's not just a burial plot itself. I'm sorry. And achuzat kever means I want the whole section. Vekbera meiti milafana. I want to bury my dead in front of me, meaning in my presence. Um, and um, the the idea of um, wanting to make the burial happen means I'm not going to consign her to somebody else, but I'm going to be involved in it myself. And further, the Ramban points out points this out. Uh, Lifanai means to bury someone in a in a casket, but he was saying they should give him a kever milifanav, meaning that he wouldn't need an aron, meaning it will be a crypt, it will be a burial crypt area. They respond vayanu at Avraham Morlo. They respond in a very um, deferential manner. Shmaenu Adoni, hear us, our master. Um, which means also obey us or listen to us, not just listen, but accept what we say. Nesi Elohim atab betocheinu, you are a prince of God in our midst. Bimivchar kvarenu kvor et meitacha. In the choicest of our burial, is it burial uh, sections or is it burial plots, like we're giving you one kever? He asked for nechuzat kever. They said, you're a prince. You're, you're a prince of God. You are very important. Bury your loved one in a burial plot. Hmm? So no person here will deny you the opportunity to bury your dead. Where? In any one of their plots. You see the subtle distinct? It's just right there on the pshat. Avram Vino asked for an achuzat kever, which does not mean just one spot. He wants a whole section for him, for his family. And they say, that's a great idea, but you know, you're so special, you're so important, you're so wonderful, you're so amazing, they're killing him with kindness, right? Beware of the, who said the added, beware of those who fall at your feet. You know that, that expression, that, that adage? I, think it, I don't remember who said it, but beware of those who fall at your feet. They may be reaching for the edge of the carpet upon which you stand. So they're saying to him, Avraham, we can't let you have your own section. You're one of us. You're so right. Now, he did say, I'm a gear and a toshav. I'm a stranger in a resident. We'll come back to that in a minute, but take a spot. But it's one of our spots. <laughs> And you know what? No one will stand in your way, Avram. And that's why Avram does not, you'd think, okay, he got what he wanted. What does he need Ephron for? He, okay, he needs Mara Machpelah, but Vayakom Avraham, Vayishtachlam Aras Lifnei Chet. So he got up and he bowed before them. What's he bowing before them for? Did he bow before them previously? Did he bow before them in Pasu Gimel? No, he got up from being in the presence of uh, his, his, the deceased, the one who deceased to him. And um, he spoke to them. But now, Avraham is bowing to them in a sign of, uh, of um, respect and deference to them. We spoke to them, and he said to them, if you truly desire to do so, uh, to bury my dead before me, so do me the following favor, basically, except from me. They said uh, um, to him, Shma'enu Aduni, he says to them, Shma'uni, Ufiguli Ephron ben Sochar. 
and looking for Ephron ben Socha. All right. Now, is it I'm looking for him, or is it do me a favor? Maybe you, Bnei Chait, can approach Ephron ben Sochar and sort of represent me. That's the what the the, the Ramban says is that. Uh, th this was an entryway to get to Ephron ben Sochar. And since they were saying, bury, you, bury, bury her wherever you want, and Avram wants that Achuzat Kever, he says instead that uh, he's interested in meeting Ephron ben Sochar, who is, according to the Ramban, Ashir v'nichbad. He's rich, he's very honorable. Um, and um, as someone who's so rich and so honorable is not going to uh, just sell off part of his own land, just like that. But if the townspeople all come and say, he wants to meet you, you know, we already offered on behalf of everyone to give him a burial plot wherever he wants for his wife, but he wants from you, well, of course, you're going to give it to him, aren't you? And those, the, 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 the pump is primed that Ephron is going to be a little bit caught because the Bnei Chait are going to be representing Avraham, if you will, he leveraged the Bnei Chait in a certain way to go there to have that uh, that conversation. There are those two words again. So he says exactly what he wants. He wants this place called the cave, known as the cave of the Machpela. Machpela, Rashi right away. Machpela, Bayit Ali Al Gabav. It's a house and it has an upstairs. Davar Acher Shikfula Bezugot. That it uh, it's it's doubled because it has doubled couples. It's it's a double a place of doubled because it is, has couples in it, right? And uh, in that first pasuk, let him give me the Mar Machpela. By the way, those. Which one of those two words, amach peila, is drush, and which one's pshat? Bayit va'aliyah, that it's a two-story in, inner, you go in and there's two stories inside, or, or to say that it's doubled, um, you know, with, with couples. Everybody's doubled, it's couples. Which one is drush? They're both from the Gemara, Masachet Erevin, that Rashi quotes, Rav and Shmuel. The answer is both. I mean, Hashem Shaloh, yeah, amrat amach peila, I was... It was kfula, it was doubled. Sajagon says it's doubled. Hakfula, it's doubled. You have to know that it's uh, two stories and it has to know that it's who is there. It's ish ishto each time. It's beautiful, but is that the pshat? Was that the pshat here at Arba? So again, just trying to understand. Sometimes the name of the place, just the name of the place. I, I don't know about you. Did anybody here move to Skokie or to Chicago? Because the, the name is so deeply meaningful. But uh, I, I suspect strongly the answer is no. It's a couple people got Mara Machpela. Rash says, no, you're missing it. Look at the Gemara. tells us there's something going on here. It's doubled. It's the place of doubling, either of something that moves between the 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 um, the, the the regular uh, terra firma ground level and something that's above it, Machpela, or maybe it's something about the Kfeilut of couples. Okay. But that's what Avram Vino asks for. Where does he want it? It's actually on the edge of his field. And he's telling you it's a region, it's an area. So the Mepharshim point out, a lot of the different Mepharshim say, again, Chizkuni and others, as for no, it's on the side. It's not going to be in the middle of his field that's going to ruin what he wants to grow. It's not so important. It's all the way at the edge. He doesn't work there. There's nothing built there, nothing happening. So what's the big deal? It's off to one side. Um, now, the way of, uh, of cemeteries generally, Rav Sajigan points out, is that it should be on the edge of the city. Yeah. Um, and uh, there's a concept here I have here in the Ultima Farshia Torah that R the Rabbeinu Yonah writes that he said this in order to block off the place that should be like separated out. Yeah. Um, and um, even if there was going to be a an issue, that uh, the Malvin points out, even though there's going to be an issue, they were not going to sell a section of their land to a foreigner. N nonetheless, it's not the middle of Ephron's property. It's like off on the edge. He'll sell it to me for full, full money. Is that because he knew who he was dealing with? Um, uh, so he should give it to me in your presence, or in your midst, rather. La'achuzat kever. It will be, uh, 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 an Achuzat Kever is more than just the Kever, the one. 
but it's a whole area, a section of uh, uh, Kvarot. Okay, let me stop here for a minute. Questions, comments, or we'll dial back and see a few more, a few more things. I'm pausing. Afikhat. Okay. Yeah, I can, yeah. can I say something? Please, Sipora, please. Okay. In Hebrew, machpela, if you say shtaim kaful shtaim, two times two, a machpela is arba. And when we do math, we say shtaim kaful shtaim. So it's always doubling. So machpela has the meaning of doubling. And maybe it's a, it's a hint for the future that there will be double couples in that place. In Hachinami, in Hachinami. By the way, there's already double, there's already Adam Vechava. Exactly. So that's my I'm just I'm just pointing out when yeah. did they, did everybody know that that was the reason? The people in, in town, Lobaru, that they all knew. But the Kadosh they, did, they weren't gonna sell it. Say it's a national treasure. We can't give it. It's a uh, a landmark. We can't give up, we can't sell it. So they didn't know. But also, does Machpelah mean Mamash? It was called that because it was um a structure oh. and something on top of it. And it's kaful. When you go there, you see it's kaful. It's double. Everything is double. Two, two, two stories. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm just saying, you know, it's, um, you know, the machpila could have been a room and another room inside, but instead yeah. it's a room and a room on top. That's a bait va'ileal gaba, what Rashi says. And the other one, it's about the kfilut of the kfula bezugot, again, which there is a couple buried there, according to Amasora, but that they knew the reason, Kolyo, they didn't know the reason. Again, depending on what it um, what it is, just depending on what it is. Um, I just I, I pointed out only because um, the, the, how how aware were the people in uh, in in Hebron of the realities of what was going on inside the cave? We don't know, and it could be that there was a word Machpelah. They didn't even call it that. And it could be because they knew there was a Bayit of Aliyah. It could be because they knew Adam and Chava were there. I find that amazing that they were willing to part with that. But Cholyot, Cholyot, Asaph was willing to part with his Bechora. Maybe they were willing to part with uh, but the uh, real plot of uh, Adam and Chava to make a quick buck. Don't know. But we should realize Avram Avinu's precarious uh, position in a certain way. Um, um, Rashi uh, says um, two things. Go back to Pasuk Dalit and look at Rashi. Rashi says, Ger v'toshav anuchim achem. Ger me'eretz acheret v'nit yashavti imachem. I'm a foreigner from another land, but I have come to dwell with you. First interpretation. In other words, Ger v'toshav, you could take uh, an arrow, draw an arrow from Ger to Toshav. I was a Ger, nam Toshav. So I'm a particular kind of resident. I was a foreigner, but I'm not now. And therefore I can say to you, you know, give me a section in your midst so I could bury my dead because I belong here. I came to dwell with you. When we drash Agada, the Madrash he adds in, sees Ger and Toshav as two sides of the same coin, but like flipping, um, flipping back and forth. Which is Umidrasha Gada Im Tirtsu Hareni Ger. If you want, then behold, I'm a foreigner. And therefore I'm asking it of you. And if you want to say that I'm really a resident uh, and I'm not a foreigner, so then I'm not asking, but I'm telling you because I deserve it uh, from a legal perspective. Why? Because God has already told the Jewish people, he's told no me, says Avraham, I will give your progeny this land. Midrash Agada. So you see Rashi tell you two different things. The Pshat is, Ger v'toshav, it's a progression. I was a Ger, now I'm a Toshav. Look at me, can you accept me? I'm, I, I'm, I'm part of you, and I became part of you. Therefore, I make this request, but it is a request. In the Midrash Agada, it's, you know what, my dear listeners, figure out what you want to take from whatever I'm asking now. Either consider me a gear and it's a request and give it to me, or consider it that I deserve it, I, I own it, if you will, because it was promised to me already, which is interesting. Well, so before I give the answers over here, or potential answers, um, 
Does anyone find anything problematic with this medrash when you hear the words? If you want me to be a ger, I'm a ger, so I'm asking nicely. But if you want to call me a toshav, I'm a citizen, I, need, I, I deserve this. Halachli, because this land is all mine. Well, I always have a problem with, with the idea that these other nations who have their own gods and their own stories and probably their own burial customs and the whole business, um, what, they're not going to believe him and they're not going to care. I mean, what, why should we think that they would know about Adam and Eve? That's not how they think the world was created. The, the, you know, the, the, none they, of might, they might have that, that some kind of a you know, uh, cre creation uh, story like that. I have no idea. But it's not a foregone conclusion, that's for sure. Right. So, uh, you know, we, we're, we're, we're expecting them to give a certain amount of respect to our Torah or something like that. And they don't know it at all. Plus, it, it, it's always, to me, it's always problematic to say that the Avot and the Imahot uh, follow the Torah before it's given on, on Sinai. Sorry. I mean, you know, otherwise uh, you wouldn't have Yaakov marrying two, two or possibly four sisters. <laughs> well, that, that's certainly a big discussion in of itself. I want to go back to one of the things that you said there about the issue, particularly that they don't know the Torah. So what, you know, he's going to tell them, hey, there's a promise. God told you a promise. So two things. First of all, I mean, it is what you're saying is correct, although it is curious that in verse six, Pasuk Vav, they refer to as a Nasi Elohim, a prince of God, whatever their concept is, but they think he's somehow godly. He's something. He's something. The different Mepharshim say, we see that you're a prophet, uh, says the, uh, the uh, Ibn Ezra. Usajigon means uh, we see you're a prince in religious matters. We call you a Nasi Elohim. There's different things. But I have another problem. I have an internal problem, even according to Rashi's rendering. Look in uh, Parshat uh, Lech Lecha, if you can hark that far back, and look at what's happening in the story of what happens with in chapter 13, in verse, um, verse 7. Right? In verse 7, in chapter 13, it actually says that there was a quarrel between the shepherds of Avram and the shepherds of Lot. And then it adds, V'akhani v'apriziyaz yoshev ba'aretz. So, so when you're, you're looking you're Rashi, you're Rashi, you're Rashi himself says, what does he say? Remember what Rashi says there? There's no Hittites there at that point? Is that the, is that the no, question? No, 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 no. So there's no Hittites, because they're farther north. That's not Hittite country. They're, they're, they're up uh, north of, um, north of, of Yerushalayim. They're in the area of uh, Beit El and, and that area there, the I and Beit El, right? No, but it's that the, the shepherds of Lot are stealing. And they're claiming that since Avram has no uh, heir and that Avraham was promised he was given the land so they could take whatever they want. It's theirs for the taking. And therefore, Rashi says, when the uh, shepherds of Avraham are upbraiding them and telling them, you are guilty of thievery, the shepherds of Lot didn't stay, stay quiet. They said, no, God told Avraham. Uh, so he got it. He has no Zerah. Zerah is his nephew, Lot. But what did the, what did the shepherds, the, the Torah testifies, the Knani and the Prizi were still living in the land. And Rashi writes here, Avram Avram did not merit the land yet. It wasn't his land. He didn't own the land. If he owned the land, that would be one thing, but he didn't. It wasn't his. Other people lived there still. Yeah, the Bnei Chet, by the way, are descended of Canaan. I mentioned that Canaan is a general term as well. It's a nation, it's the children of Canaan, but it's also the descendants of Canaan. So the Canaan, Canaan, we saw that back in chapter 10, that includes the Bnei Chet. But these aren't the Bnei Chet, I don't think, per se. It's uh, it's too far north, I, I believe, for, for Hittites to be dwelling, I believe. But look in our Pasuk, he comes, according to the Medrash here, uh, the, uh, Avram Avinu says, uh, it's mine. If you want to call me a Tosha. I mean, Adin, I deserve it because God said, I'm going to give your progeny this land. So this is a, a bit of a, you know, a bit of a, 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 a problem uh, in the um, just even internal to Rashi's um, uh, understanding. Yeah. So um, how to answer. So the various uh, Mepharshim explain 
that um, that perhaps what it means is that now that Yitzchak Avinu was born, uh, the Chizkuni writes it this way, and a couple of commentaries on the Rav, uh, Rav Eliyahu Mizrahi and uh, Levusha Ora commentaries on Rashi, they say that's what Rashi means. Since there's already a Yitzchak, so Lazar so Yitzchak's alive. So therefore, now he 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 got it. It's his. You know, is it the Pshat? No, I'm trying to explain the the internal consistency of the uh, of the of the of the Medrash. All right. If you don't like it, you can go back to the Pshat. The Pshat is in Gerutoshav. The Rambam writes that uh, Ger Toshav, a Ger Toshav means we have a category called a Ger Toshav, a resident alien would be called. So we have a category, that kind of a person, you have to take care of them. And our whole Torah is uh, is uh, logical and it makes sense and it goes by the protocols of the of the land. So uh, that says the Orachim. So the Orachim quotes this, this idea. So therefore, uh, if I'm a Ger Toshav, so it's appropriate. You should give me an achuzat kever. I live here. I didn't come from here originally, but I here live here now. I'm making, setting down my roots here. So it's like I'm, I'm, a, I'm a citizen. So it's a, it's a right of citizenship. All right, it's an idea. Rabbi Soloveitchik, uh, in his beautiful chumash, the chumash Masor harav, which I highly recommend, beautiful uh, um, uh, set on chumash. Uh, he is writing homilies. He's not writing exegesis, but uh, homiletics, the two different things. Yeah, the exegesis is parshanut. What's going on in the pasuk? What are the questions I have based on how it's written, and 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 how do I understand it? Uh, drashot are I'm, I'm starting from the place of the concept that I have in mind that I want to explain, and I find a source for it in the in the uh, in the Torah itself. So gerbet toshav. I'm a stranger. I'm a resident. So just read you a paragraph because it oh it's, it gives you an idea about something we take with us uh, at all times. Asked Rabbi Solveitch, quoted from his book, The Rav Speaks. He asked, what is our position vis-a-vis modern civilization with respect to science, to Western culture, to the countries in which we live? The answer is enshrined in these words. Certainly, I am a resident. I am one of you. I engage in business as you do. I speak your language. I take full part in your social economic institutions. But at the same time, I am a stranger and in some aspects, a foreigner. I belong to a particular world, one that is completely foreign to you. It is a world in which I am at one with the creator. It is a world populated by characters unknown to you with a tradition that you do not understand with spiritual values that seem impractical in your eyes, pragmatic children of hate. It is a world full of altars and sacrifices, a world of Torah, of loving kindness, of sanctity and purity. You live differently, pray differently. Your conception of charity is different from ours. Your days of rest are different from ours, and so on. In these matters, I'm a stranger in your world, and you are a stranger in mine. Jewish burial is one of the elements with respect to which we are strangers and foreigners to one another. A Jew dies and is buried differently. A Jew requires a cemetery of his own, a Jewish grave. Ger Vitoshav. And in many different essays where Slovachik went into this idea of the Ger Vitoshav and our relationship with the uh, with the world at uh, at large. Two weeks ago, I was to have um, uh, at my Shabbos table the former Israeli ambassador to the United Kingdom, uh, Ambassador uh, Daniel Taub. So he um, he now works for an organization in Israel uh, called um, the Yad Hanadiv. The Yad Hanadiv is uh, the Nadiv was one of the members of the Rothschild family. Uh, Edmund James de Rothschild, who was French and um, ha- who came to Israel many different times to do uh, things to help with Hakamata Medina. Um, and he died in France. Uh, but then he was reburied in Israel. So Rabbi Soloveitchik, in another book, which is also quoted in this Chumash, says the following. It's a long, exactly the same as I quoted it when the ambassador came. Um, it was Parshat uh, Toldot, but I said, I can't help myself. I, I, I read him, I showed him this. Said, oh, look. Oh, so because I said, it's who you work. You work for that foundation, for this great Jew, for all the great uh, generosity that he was responsible for. So Rav Soloveitchik writes, when French Premier Charles de Gaulle was informed that the Rothschild family was planning to transfer Edmund James de Rothschild's remains to Israel, 
he became indignant and remarked, I always thought that Monsieur de Rothschild was a good Frenchman. Now I realize that I was mistaken. Who was a good Frenchman? One who was reared in France, educated in a French school, whose native tongue is French, who is ready to take arms to defend France, and who is buried in French soil. The same philosophy, says Rabbi Soloveitchik, was expounded by the Hittites. Since you are a prince in our midst, since you are a Hittite prince, we believe that you should bury your illustrious wife in our graveyard. Listen to us, our master. You are our prince. You are ours. Bury your wife with our princes. She belongs in the choices of our sepulchers. And of course, Avon Vino is saying, no, that's not what I want. I want, I understand. He says to them, Tnuli achuzat kaver. Vast distinction between these two. And um, when we go today to that area, when you walk there, you know, uh, the square outside of Maran Hamach that's where this conversation happened. That's where Avram Vina was. It's much the same place. And that's where the townspeople, they had the whole meeting. And then he's right. It's all within sight of the same, the same little section. Again, and that building was not there at that time. That's the building that uh, Herod built. But this is, this is the dialogue that's going on. Uh, Avram Vina wants next is to zero in on what he really came for, which is Maratha Machpelah. But in order to get there, First is a negotiation with the Bnei Chet and the idea that if he is being held up as their prince, then certainly their prince, who is of them and from them and belongs to them, he's more than just a regular person looking to, for a place to bury his uh, immortal beloved. He is a, a, a state property. And what does he do instead? He bows to them. Why? Why do something that seems on the face of it to be uh, obsequious? The answer is, he is saying to them, you have it wrong. I'm, I, I, the, the king is not going to bow to the subjects. The prince doesn't bow. That's not really who I am. I'm so thankful to be here. I feel like such a foreigner. I really couldn't take a burial plot, a plot with the rest of you. Instead, what I need is an achuzat kever. And therefore, he said, if you're already giving me whatever I want, here is what I want. Make an introduction, but also, according to some, speak for me. And the point is, he will give me the Mar Machpela, which is at the edge of his field. But Kesef Malay Danali, Avram Avinu is very careful. I want to pay for it. It shouldn't be a gift because the gift can be rescinded. But I also want it to be a, a, business, um, a business deal, if you will. And when you look at the next pasuk, pasuk yod, ve'efron yoshev betoch b'nei chet. He's dwelling in the midst of the b'nei chet. He's in their midst means he belongs there. Yeah? And actually, the, he's yoshev betoch b'nei chet. I imagine it dramatically. The crowd parted and he was sitting there the whole time. He seems to be part of it. It's not that they had to go call him and fetch him. He's there. He hears it. But also, you have to realize that sort of the... The, the it's all in the public square, quite literally. Everyone hears it, everyone sees it, everyone's standing there. So he's there. So it wants you to know that the B'nei Chet are listening to everything that's happening at this, uh, at this exact uh, uh, moment, right? Uh, by the way, Sajigan points out that uh, this person... Um, you know, he is, he is called a chiti by, uh, by Avram Avinu. Oh, no, not by Avram Avinu, sorry. Uh, he's called Vayan Efron Achiti. He became a chiti. So whether he's, as a chizkuni wants to say, he's not really from there, but he came there later. Yeah, maybe, but now he sits in the midst of the Bnei Chet and he became a chiti. Avram did not become a chiti. He resisted the, 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 the invitation, the importunings, maybe the, the, um, whatever the word is, the, the, the cajoling that was going on, the, you're, just, you're just like one of us. You're saying, no, it's not going to happen. So the response of Ephron is also going to be in front of everybody. It has a very um, ceremonial ring to it. But I just to point out that there was a progression. First the Bnei Chet, then one among them, who may or may not have originally been from there, but was the quintessential uh, uh, resident where everyone is going to be present and accounted for. And the Chol Ba'e Shar Iro, 
uh, uh, um, means that everyone, everyone is, uh, all the people who are in town, the Radak writes it that way, and right? everyone in, 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 uh, in, 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 in business, and the Ramban says, well, actually, it's all of the merchants, and it's everybody who lives in that, in that area. Rashi has another beautiful idea. No, it's really about the chesed that for Sarah Imenu, they were going with chesed for Sarah. Everyone stopped. The marketplace halted. Everybody came to be Gomel Chesed to uh, to uh, to Sarah. So uh, it's a, a beautiful uh, beautiful uh, section. Of course, we have more to um, more to say and to learn, but we're kind of out of time for today. So I guess I'll say goodbye. Any closing comments or questions before we say goodbye? Not that I can answer them necessarily, but no, just a comment. The irony is that today we are called occupiers of that place. You're talking about today. Yeah. We are called the occupiers yeah. Yeah. of that place. It, it, it's one of many. You see the irony. We one are of the many I ironic uh, inversions. Yeah, of the reality of the. Um, yeah, of the reality of the uh, of the world. The mm -hmm. Gemara in one place in uh, Sanhedrin, I believe in Perak I believe it's there. It says there are three places in the Torah that um, Davka were purchased. Uh, Davka, so that no one would ever be able to say we took them. The three places are Shem, Shem, and, and Marat exactly. Yeah, but apparently we're in Galut. Even in Eretz Yisrael, we're still in Galut in the sense, temp, not in the place, but in the in in time. We're waiting. We're waiting for the redemption because we see how uh, contested it is. Ad uh, Ad We see mm -hmm. how it uh, in Ad Yomazeh that it's still going back and forth. <laughs> By the way, the Shari the Ba Chobai Shari Ro today. If you go to Marat Machpelah. If you are outside of Marat Pela before you go up the steps to go into the plaza, if you make a left and you walk to the next clearing where you can make a, a right and you go up, you're going to be up against the wall of the old city and you there right there. And there's the shellet that claims that the, that's the place of Avner Ben Ner where he was killed, which yes, yes, no, no, I don't know. There's a turnstile there that you cannot go through. I was Zoha once to go through it last year in January in 2020 before COVID. I was on a mission there. I went through a turnstile, having come through the old city of Hebron, through the marketplace. And that marketplace it is looks to me to be incredibly ancient. I can't say for sure, but it's literally like with stalls, with people with bags of, like like um, uh, like Machane Yehuda, but, yeah. but not Machane yeah. Yehuda, but much, much older, old stones uh -huh. and people standing, some look ancient, you know, that, and, and when I walked through it, I thought, Mm, this is the this is the talking. This is the, the the marketplace is mamash next to the Ma'ara. The Ma'ara is on. Off yeah, I know, I know. I've been okay. there a couple of times. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's interesting. Talking. Okay. Anyway, that's all I have time for today. I wish everyone a good day. Great morning. See you Thursday on Zoom. On Zoom Thursday, 9:30 a.m.